When you're reading about different interpretations of the probability concept, you might encounter the term logical probability used basically as a synonym for classical probability, which we discussed in the previous tutorial. There's nothing wrong with this usage if it's clear what you're talking about. But there's potential for confusion here because the term logical probability is also used to refer to a broader 20th century research program in the foundations of probability theory and inductive reasoning. And there are significant differences between this interpretation of probability and the classical interpretation of the 17th and 18th century. So in this tutorial, I want to give a very brief overview of the difference and what in broad outline the logical interpretation of probability is all about. What I'm not going to do here is try to describe any particular formulation of the logical interpretation in detail because it becomes technical and philosophically sophisticated very quickly. And my goal here is just to promote a basic level of probability literacy to average people so that we can have informed critical discussions about issues that involve probability concepts when they come up. Okay, the basic idea behind logical probability is to treat it as a generalization of the concept of logical entailment in deductive logic. Just to refresh your memory, in a deductively valid argument, the premises logically entail the conclusion in the sense that if the premises are all true, the conclusion can't possibly be false. The truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. If the argument is deductively invalid, then the premises do not logically entail the conclusion, which simply means that even if the premises are all true, it's still possible for the conclusion to be false. So logical entailment in this sense is a bivalent or binary property. It only has two values, yes or no, like a digital switch. Every argument is either deductively valid or it isn't. There are no degrees of validity, no degrees of logical entailment. However, we can all recognize examples where logical support seems to come in degrees, and we can sometimes quantify the strength of the logical entailment between premises and a conclusion. Here's an example. There are 10 students in this room. None of them are wearing green shirts. One is wearing a red shirt. One student is chosen randomly from this group. Conclusion. The student that was chosen is wearing a green shirt. This is the case where the conclusion doesn't follow with deductive certainty. The argument isn't deductively valid in this sense, but our intuition is that the conclusion does follow with a high probability. How high? Well, we're about 90% sure that the conclusion is true. Not 100%, but still something that a reasonable person might bet on. Another way to say this is that the premises don't completely entail the conclusion, but they partially entail the conclusion. So on this reading, the statement, the student is probably wearing a green shirt, or more precisely, it is 90% likely that the student is wearing a green shirt, these statements can be read as making a claim about the degree of partial entailment or logical support that the premises confer on the conclusion. Now, the logical approach to probability defines probability in these terms as a measure of the degree of partial entailment or degree of logical support that a conclusion has given certain premises. When you think of the probability of a statement as ranging in a value of between 0 and 1, then 1 represents classical logical entailment, where the premises guarantee the truth of that statement, and values less than 1 represent greater and lesser degrees of partial entailment. Another way this is often framed is in terms of the degree of confirmation that evidence confers on a hypothesis where the evidence is identified with the premises of an argument and the hypothesis is identified with the conclusion. When you phrase it in this way, you're making explicit the connection between logical probability and some very basic issues in scientific reasoning, like how to estimate how likely it is that a scientific theory is true, given all the evidence that we have so far. Now, one of the interesting features of this approach to probability is that it makes no sense to talk about the probability of the conclusion all by itself. You're always talking about conditional probability, the probability of the conclusion given the premises. Unconditional probability makes no sense. Probability is always relative to some body of evidence or some background assumptions. Now, many critics of logical probability take issue with this point. They think it should be perfectly reasonable to talk about unconditional probabilities. So that's the basic idea behind logical probability. The difficulty with this approach comes when you try to work out this idea in detail. For this to be a candidate for a general theory of probability, you'll need to work out a general account 
of what this logical relationship is and how to operationalize it, how to actually assign a value to the strength of the logical support that evidence confers on a hypothesis. And this has proven to be a very tricky problem to solve. It has preoccupied some of the smartest minds of the 20th century, including the British economist John Maynard Keynes in the 1920s, and most notably the philosopher Rudolf Carnap in the 1950s. It's fair to say that no one has yet come up with a satisfactory way of defining and operationalizing logical probability. The difficulty of the problem arises in part from the desire to have a genuinely logical definition of partial entailment, or degree of confirmation. That means that this relation should only depend on logical features of the world, or more accurately, logical properties of our descriptions of the world. So for example, it shouldn't depend on specific knowledge we may have about the particular world that we find ourselves in. It should be independent of that kind of substantive empirical knowledge. So Carnap, for example, tries to define a confirmation function that applies to formal languages. And to illustrate the idea, he uses little toy models of worlds with, say, only three objects in them and only one property that each object either has or doesn't have. In these toy worlds, you can list all the possible states that such a world can be in, and you can define different event types as subsets on this state space. And when you do this, you can show how, given information about one of the objects, you can formally define how likely it is that certain facts will be true of the other objects. So in this example, if you have evidence that ball C is red, then this will change your estimation of the likelihood that, say, ball A is red, or that all the balls are red. Now, Carnap was trying to generalize this procedure in a way that would give a general definition of logical confirmation in the form of a confirmation function that would apply to all cases where evidence has a logical relationship to a hypothesis. But Carnap himself realized that there's more than one way to define the confirmation function in his system, and logic alone can't tell us which of these to choose. The details don't matter too much for our purposes, but Carnap's system runs into technical and philosophical problems when you try to work it out. There are other objections to the whole program of logical probability that I won't go into here, but again, most of them arise, as I said, from the constraint that the definition of probability be a logical or formal one that doesn't rely on specific knowledge about the world. So to sum up, it's fair to say that today this program is mostly of academic interest to certain philosophers and people working in the foundations of probability. It's not where the cutting edge of the discussion is among scientists or the mainstream of people working on probability. Today, most of the discussion is between proponents of frequency-based approaches to probability and proponents of subjective or Bayesian approaches which is what we'll be turning to in the next couple of tutorials.